Hello, everybody. I just want to welcome you today to today's webinar, Anticipatory Grief and End of Life Care, How to Prepare for Life, um, Prepare and Care for Life-Changing Events. My name is Sarah Tarani, and I'm the Program Coordinator for Triage Cancer. I will be moderating today's webinar. First off, I'd like to apologize for the multiple reschedulings of this webinar, and thank you for all of you who could attend today. It was a frustrating situation for all of us, I assure you. Now, before I turn it over to today's distinguished speaker, I just need to go over some quick housekeeping. All callers will be muted during the duration of this webinar. If you have any questions or technical problems, please type them in the chat box to the side of your screen. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing by the end of the week on our website, triagecancer.org. At the end of the webinar, you will be redirected to a survey. Please take a few moments to fill it out and let us know what you think about today's webinar. As part of the accreditation process to give you CEUs, we have, to, um, we have a disclosure that the planners and presenters of this program have not disclosed any pertinent financial relationships or conflicts of interest. This education program does not have any commercial or non-commercial support other than the support listed from sponsors and partners. We are offering CEUs to nurses through the Oncology Nursing Society. In order to receive the units, you must have registered online for today's session. People who are listening in on someone else's computer are not eligible for credit. That's an important point. You also must attend the entire webinar in order to receive the maximum number of credits. Within one week of this webinar completion, um, you must complete the evaluation. You'll be redirected to the survey at the conclusion of the webinar, and I'll be sending out an email reminder about this information on Friday by 5 p.m. Please note that on the evaluation, it asks for your name and email address, and you must include these so that we can certify that you've completed the evaluation. The email is the address we'll be used to mail your certificate. We will be sending out certificates within four to six weeks. If you are listening in on your telephone today, please make sure that you indicate that on your evaluation because I have to do some crazy matching work in the back end to make sure that works. If you have any questions or prob experience problems, email us at info at triagecancer.org. For those of you who aren't aware, Triage Cancer is a national nonprofit organization that provides information and resources on cancer survivorship issues. We offer this education in a few different ways. First, we host a Speakers Bureau of Experts in all types of cancer survivorship issues available to organizations putting on educational events. You can read our speaker bios or request a speaker on our website. We also host and participate in events all over the country for patients, survivors, caregivers, advocates, and healthcare professionals. More information about our signature events like our triage cancer conferences and in-service training um, can be seen on our website at triagecancer.org. We also have monthly webinars. The next one is actually next week. It's protecting yourself and your family by planning ahead. And our full schedule can be seen online again. And finally, we have a plethora of online resources and tools available for free. For example, we have charts of state laws on employment, disability, health insurance, and health insurance related information. Our website is a really robust place for information for you guys. We also have quick guides on various topics such as employment, finances, privacy, and clinical trials. These are designed as sort of a snapshot on a particular topic. And lastly, we have an educational blog and e-newsletter where we post late breaking news about cancer related legal issues and other happenings around the cancer community. And this brings us to today's speaker, Shirley Otis Green. Shirley Otis Green is the Clinical Director of, Con of Consulting Services with the Coalition for Compassionate Care of California and the founder of Collaborative Caring. Shirley's education, research, and, co and consultation efforts focus on quality of life, palliative care, leadership development, and the creation of meaningful organizational change. 
She has been the principal investigator on studies with over $3.3 million in external funding. She is also the co-editor of the Oxford Textbook of Palliative Work. And that, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Shirley. Thank you so very much, Sarah. Thank you so what a much, pleasure. Sarah. What a pleasure. I'm wondering if there's an echo as I speak. Perhaps not. I'm not. Um, Wonderful. Um, again, thank you so very much for this opportunity. I'm really delighted to have an opportunity to speak with all of you. And again, welcome to this uh, presentation. What we want to do today is outline the common emotions, reactions, and challenges for preparing for life changes. And those changes can be diverse. There are lots of losses that people with cancer will face. Um, it could be their own death or the death of their uh, loved one, changes in relationship, financial implications to dealing with cancer, and of course, lots of role changes as well as behavioral changes that can occur as part of coping with this uh, serious life event. We want to also talk about practical tips to help you, um, to help the patients prepare and care for themselves um, leading up to, during, and following these types of changes. Our goal is to talk about grief, loss, and bereavement, not just as something that affects the patients and the families that you serve, but also to be cognizant that there are implications for us as clinical providers. So we're gonna be talking about all three aspects throughout our hour together. All of us dealing with cancer face multiple losses throughout the entire illness trajectory, and each person is going to grieve that in their own way. One of the reasons that I feel that an interdisciplinary care approach is so vital because it allows us to address the multidimensional aspects of patient suffering. We can best support the survivors and the patients if we have a full team available to assist with whatever their concerns might be. We know when we do this work that loss is not just about death. We need to be cognizant of anticipatory grief. And that, again, is a uniquely individual response. No two people are going to go through that in the same way. It's not orderly or predictable, but it is culturally influenced. And there are special needs for us as we age through the lifespan. We need to incorporate the awareness of the loss, the experience of the loss, and eventually integrate the loss for our optimal mental health. Loss can be of a person, a thing, a dream, a relationship, a role, a situation, and grief is a normal response to any of these losses. We might use the term mourning as the outward social expression of loss. And again, this is a multidimensional experience, very influenced from who we are religiously and culturally. Now, th again, those of us who do this work know that from the very moment of a diagnosis of a serious illness such as cancer, everything seems changed. I like to think of this as our own personal earthquake, reminding us that we are not in control and that the world isn't as predictable as we might have once believed. This is a picture of the uh, interstate near our home. I live here in Southern California, and this was taken by my husband when in the 1994 earthquake that affected Los Angeles. And I can remember that terror. Suddenly, we weren't sure what was going to happen. All bets were off. Would we be able to get to work? Would we be able to do the things that we had planned? Was this the pre-quake to the quote, big one? And I think people with cancer have that same disorientation, that same sense of now I don't know. Will we still be able to have our summer vacation? Will our retirement plans be effective? Will I be able to hold my granddaughter? Everything suddenly seems precarious. And that sense of unsurety can make things really difficult. I've had pan cancer patients tell us that this is an invitation to live life as if it really matters. People will often talk about how they reprioritized. Suddenly everything was a gift. That awareness of how things taste, how they feel, being able to get up in the morning, that awareness that suddenly everything is precious can be a wonderful aspect of a very uncomfortable and disorienting experience. Our job as cancer providers is to try and assist patients in being able to negotiate this change in how they viewed the world and be able to have the healthiest coping possible. If we're not able to address these things, then that anticipatory grief can lead to an existential crisis. 
that sudden awareness that these days might be my last um, can be extraordinarily disconcerting. Uh, people can become anxious. They can become depressed. They can, again, deal with this in innumerable ways, uh, many of which can have a negative uh, repercussions both to them and to their families. And we as healthcare providers also have the possibility of falling into an existential crisis. Existential suffering comes in whenever our meaning and purpose in life is called into question. Many of us have a worldview that says the world should be fair. If we're good people, good things should happen. And cancer is a reminder that that's not the way the world works. No one deserves to have cancer. No one deserves to have these horrible things that they have to now face or to have a loved one um, perhaps lose their life prematurely. We know that we have to assist people as they're uh, uh, grappling with these really major uh, feelings of, of despair and, and uh, disorder. People, again, like to think that they're in control. We talk about control, especially in our US culture, you know, all the time. People like to feel confident that they can make things happen and that they're in charge and that, that um, it's, the world is predictable. But that illusion of control is definitely shattered with the diagnosis of something as serious as cancer. If cancer can happen, anything can happen. And suddenly a person can feel more powerless than they've ever felt before. Questions about how this could possibly work, how, what kind of God would allow this to happen? Those are questions that our patients often are struggling with. Those of you who might be on call or, or perhaps covering night shifts, um, it's not at all uncommon to sneak into a person's room to do vitals or to uh, check on, on the, uh, the machinery that we have going to support people and to find that person at two in the morning um, sobbing quietly in their bed as they're grappling again with these really difficult challenges. It's important for us to recognize that for many people, they might not have ever had to face some of these really difficult questions about meaning and pur purpose in life. And cancer, again, it offers that um, stark reality of now's the time to say, you know, what do we really think about how the world works? Many people don't have foundational premises and choices authentically made, and therefore their life might be filled with guilt or regret. My official social work word here is stuckness. And the idea that people feel stuck if they're not dealing with um, situations that, again, are authentic for themselves. A patient that I recall who really affected me many years ago when I was working directly in cancer care, her words have stayed with me forever. She was a beautiful woman. She had everything that one could hope for in her life. Beautiful family. She had beautiful clothes. She was uh, um, always perfectly attired. Um, she went through her cancer experience as, as uh, robustly as anyone could. I would offer, you know, social work opportunities to touch base with her, and she would always just you know, whisk, uh, whisk me away. Um, she had no need um, for such things. She was in control and in charge. And then one day, completely un, um, surprising to me, you know, she, she stormed into my office and closed the door and began sobbing. And she was crying so much. And I tried to understand and, and support her as she went through that. And when she could finally take her breath, she said, I realize I'm going to die. And the next word she spoke, as I say, still echo in my mind. She said, I've, I don't know who I am. If I was on death row and they said, what would you want for your last meal? She said, I couldn't tell you. She goes, if you ask me, what's my favorite color? I don't know. I wear red because everyone says I look good in red. I don't think I even like red. On Mondays, we're going to have meatloaf because that's what we do. But I don't think I even like meatloaf. I know when I pick up my kids, I know what music's going to be playing in the car because we listen, or we listen to the radio based on what they like to hear. She goes, I don't know what my favorite things are. And now it's too late. And I remember how, how explicitly she could articulate that sense that she had lived a life that was fraudulent, that it wasn't her life, and she wasn't sure what really mattered most to her. 
And I think that all of us who are uh, working with patients who are, are struggling with these issues have similar stories that they could tell. And we know the challenge is when, if we come face to face with that, while we're dealing with cancer, we are going to need energy and courage to make the kinds of changes that would get us back on track, but energy and courage are in short supply if our illness is going to worsen, if our treatments are going to take a toll, we're going to be fatigued, we're going to be anxious, we're going to have less energy and perhaps even less courage. She anticipated that she would not be able to have her life turn around and that she would have a difficult death. And indeed, her prediction came through. She struggled until the very end and was filled with what she identified as guilt and remorse. When we see people who are struggling in that way, it might be overtly that they're able to tell us like this dear woman did, but sometimes we see it in these kinds of things where we see someone who begins over or under eating or who turns to substance use or again is, is filled with hopelessness and helplessness or generalized negativity where everything seems to be frustrating and, and they become hostile and, and perhaps angry and a lash out at the dear people that are taking care of them, whether that be the professional staff or their own personal loved ones. It's important for us in those times to be able to have a, a set of tools or skills that we can turn to. I like to think of it as having a toolkit or a toolbox at the ready for us, where we can reach into that toolkit and identify some, some things that we know can work to help us. And so the more of those tools and skills we have, the more adept we'll be able to be. It's like the, the carpenter who only has a hammer, which works fine if he only deals with nails, but we need to have more tools that are, are in our toolkit so that we can address the needs of more people. So being able to uh, feel comfortable using life review or uh, the ability to reframe experiences um, if we are able to be uh, culturally nuanced and be able to draw from the theological, or philosophical, or mythical stories that, that re are relative um, uh, and relatable to that particular culture group that we might be serving, if we can normalize experiences, or if we're um, skilled with cognitive and behavioral interventions that can assist people in being able to um, find an, a place of inner calm where they can do the hard work of reflection and, and uh, decisions that, that need to be made so that their choices can be more authentic and more um, in line with, with who they are and what it is that they're, they're working with. So being able to adjust our expectations and be able to uh, reframe or reprioritize is going to be a key skill for the patients that we see. Helping people to debrief, and a phrase that I like of degrief, um, letting people know that things take as long as they take. Um, certainly that's true as we deal with cancer. We know that there is such ambivalence. You know, people would like to know which um, box that they're in and what the future is going to be, but we can't tell. We know a certain percentage of people might have a certain experience, and those are based on probability samples of large numbers of people. But we don't know for Mary or for John or for Bill or for Mario, we don't know what their experience is going to be. When they look at the doctor or the nurse and say, how long do I have? We don't know. Unless the person is imminently dying, it's hard for us to predict. Many studies have looked at this and demonstrated for us that the closer we are to someone, the more strongly um, we feel uh, liking of that patient, the worse our predictions are. So being able to recognize that that ambiguity is a part of this experience. All of us, again, whether the professional staff or the family members or the patient going through this, need to have an ability to cope with stressful situations. We need to practice those skills. Many of you might be delivering chemotherapy to a patient or um, assisting as they go through some other kind of challenging treatment and being able to help people to do deep breathing or calmness exercises or being able to um, reframe the experience in a way that can make it more tolerable. Those are wonderful skills to have in our toolbox.
And we certainly know that we need to encourage people along this journey. So helping to celebrate even the smallest of achievements, that they were able to take that, that needle stick without um, passing out, that they were able to uh, tolerate coming in for that scary appointment. You know, we wanna celebrate the accomplishments that they've made. It's important for us to encourage physical self-care, but also care related to our social needs, um, being able to think of ourselves and what our needs are, and then treat ourselves the way we might to our, um, someone that we deeply cared about. So being able to nurture ourselves. And again, if we can model some of these skills as providers, we're gonna be more authentic when we encourage our patients or their family members to model these um, or to uh, practice these skills as well. So it's important for us to demonstrate that we take good care. When we demonstrate that, that we're not in, that a good caregiver doesn't stop to eat, drink, or go to the bathroom during our shift, we're modeling that when the family caregiver takes their loved one home, that they too should put their needs completely on hold. And we know that that's ultimately not in their best interests, nor was it in ours if we do that. Being able to be mindful again of supportive strategies that are useful, being able to share our authentic hopes and dreams and fears with someone who can be a close confidant, being able to surround ourselves with family or friends or pets, things that, that help us to find the magic of each day. Those are important strategies that can help us to cope with the difficulties and the challenges that we might face. It's important for us to have a supportive network and to ensure that the patients and families that we see are encouraged to do the same. If we have support groups that we can refer them to, that's certainly um, helpful. Those might be in person, it could be online. We wanna make sure that people aren't going through this in an isolated way. One of the best strategies to be um, looking for as a screening tool is does this person come alone to each of their appointments? It's as simple as literally saying, are there other people in your life who can assist you as you go through this? And are, if there's a long pause before that person can identify someone who could be of assistance, we know that we need to step up our supportive strategies. Dealing with cancer might be a time when people find that it's important to reconnect with lost traditions. We saw many of the people um, that I was uh, meeting with who would tell me that they maybe, quote, used to be Catholic or used to attend a certain church or denominational activity and be able to, um, even as a, a non-spiritual care provider, being able to check in as to um, what might have led to them discontinuing that and offering them the opportunity to talk with someone more about that, um, being able, again, to use the skills of your entire team. This might be a wonderful time for a chaplain referral. It's important for people, and again, I'm going to put air quotes around the word miracle, but to celebrate the things that give them, um, that, that nurture their soul. So being able to see the, the beauty in the day. All of us um, benefit from an attitude of gratitude, and there have been many studies on positive psychology that demonstrate the um, the amazingly therapeutic uh, benefits of being able to be thankful for the smaller things in our life. Being able to have a gratitude journal can be a very supportive strategy to assist people who are facing end of life. No matter how seriously ill I am, how sick I become, can I still delight in the beauty of the day? The fact that my kitty is at my side, the fact that the birds are singing outside, the fact that I can open my eyes and look through a window and see the, the flowers that are blooming. Being able to celebrate those miracles that surround all of us all the time as an important piece of successful coping. All of us benefit from being able to set aside time from self, for self-assessment and introspection, reflection, meditation, prayer, however that person might define that. Being able to encourage people to see that even at end of life, there are opportunities to grow deeper and richer connections with people or the relationships that we might have um, spiritually or socially. Being able to see how this can be a time that slows us down. There have been so many wonderful um, novelizations and memoirs that, that um, 
so beautifully articulate this experience. There's a lovely book called When Breath Becomes Air that talks about a, a young uh, surgeon and his, his uh, quest to become this wonderful professional that was cut short. I think he was only 34 when diagnosed with a horrible cancer that eventually leads to his death. And as this young man writes so beautifully, this is a chance for him to take the time to learn that inner landscape a little bit better. He'd been so busy otherwise. And being able to see, even in the depths of his illness, that there were gifts to be discovered, that this was a time to focus and prioritize on the things that really do matter the most. Um, many, many people have written, um, I think every uh, theological uh, background has uh, encouragement for us to be able to see the importance of slowing down, taking that deep breath, spending some time um, quieting down our soul and being able to um, explore what really matters most. Sylvia Borstein has said, life is painful but perhaps suffering is optional. And that's a lovely reminder for us that when I define suffering, I think of it as pain plus fear. The idea that it might be painful to go through cancer and hopefully we're gonna do a really wonderful job of exquisitely addressing the symptoms that people have. But perhaps suffering is something that we can really ameliorate, being able to help people to minimize that fear, to help people feel supported so that they're not going through this experience alone. Those can be really important gifts that we can offer. I'm going to come back to one of my key themes. When I think about end of life care, I think about the importance of authenticity. And as a social worker, I think about my definition of that is, is thinking about mental health as the degree that we have our beliefs and our values and our actions in harmony. To the degree that we have these things authentically lined up, that we what we do and how we feel and how we spend our days are all consistent with what we say are our values. I think that leads to a sense of well-being and self-esteem. And to the degree that we feel that we've used our unique talents and opportunities and gifts wisely, I think that goes a long way toward helping us to minimize regret. So being able to be thoughtful about who it is that I am, who is it that I am authentically? There's a, a wonderful story about the Titanic and the people who were, um, uh, you all might be familiar with the Titanic. It, in 1912 was this wonderful ocean liner filled with all these wonderful people making its inaugural voyage across the Atlantic. And it was racing to try and beat the previous record. It was gonna set a record on its maiden voyage. Oh, it was gonna be so grand and glorious. But of course, they hit an iceberg and they didn't have enough um, lifeboats for all of the people. And so the story goes that the people that were on the lifeboats were able to, um, in fact, they're rescued and, and were able to get their reports. And all these people, even from the different boats, reported that they could still hear the band playing on the Titanic as the ship itself sank and the rest of the people unfortunately drowned. And I think of those band peoples as, as being the, the most heroic of folks, because what that says to me is they were so authentically who they were, that their beliefs and their values and actions were so unified that even though they recognized, they were certainly aware that they were going to die, that they had about an hour and a half from when that last boat sails and before the, the ship sinks. So they've got an awareness. What are you going to do in the last 90 minutes of your life? What would you do as a, as a listener? How would you spend that time? Would it be so clear to you that you would know what it is you could do that could still be of service? I doubt that it was in their contract that it said in case of a, a wedding or a, a baby being born, we want you to play. Um, if someone has a birthday, you know, that's in your contract. You have to be as a band, you have to be able to handle that. On this voyage, if we should sink, you guys need to play at the end. I don't think it was in the contract. I think it was something that they spontaneously did because it was so authentic to who they were. 
And they knew that the music they could provide could be of comfort to the people that were left behind. And I think how, again, I don't have a, I guess a stronger word, but how heroic it would be, how I would hope that what I'm doing and living with each day of my life with, is so purely what I'm here on earth to do, that even again, if my time were to suddenly be very limited, that I'd be able to say, I know how I wanna spend that time. I know how to spend my last few hours, days, moments. For us to have that kind of, of uh, resiliency, we need to have strong personal balance. So within the, each of these different dimensions or domains, I hope that we are able to be in touch with what our, our needs are and to make sure that we take care of them. Again, one of my screening techniques for people in regard to uh, potentially depression would be to ask someone that I might first meet, what is it that makes your heart happy? And then internally in my head, I count how long before the answer. And to the degree that it's a really long time, I start getting concerned. And if the person maybe says, well, I like to go fishing. And I then my follow-up question is, when's the last time you did that? And again, I'm counting as they think. And if they say, well, 1942, I've got a pretty clear idea that this is a person who's not in touch with the things that give them joy. So it's important for us to check these things for our patients, for our families, but it's important for us again too, to be mindful of our own balance. I've worked in many settings where the assumption was that you work 12 hour days and then you did a double and that each of these um, experiences in work were so important and so overwhelming that time for for hobbies or for outside thoughts or to take care of ourselves was somehow less important but i'm here to stress that if we're going to do good end of life care for those that we care about, we need to make sure that we're living our own life with integrity and authenticity. I don't want us as care providers to be having regret on our deathbed that we let some of these things pass. So I think again, both for our patients, our families, and for us as providers, being able to attend to our spiritual and physical and cognitive and emotional and productivity and social dimensions are so, so important. And you notice throughout, I have talked about things that, again, I'm going to put air quotes around, but are in the area of spiritual. And I think it's important for us to recognize that, that for many of the for many of us that, that quality of life has these four domains, that it is not just a physical thing, that there is this kind of sense of, of spirituality, even if we define that again separately from religion, but the idea of meaning and connectedness, that sense of purpose, that that's a universal. So being able to um, be thoughtful about however this patient or family or I as a provider, however I might um, perceive of God or spirituality or religion, I still have to come to terms with how and why is suffering allowed or caused and how do I find meaning in this experience? I remember sitting at the bedside of a woman whose child was dying of cancer. And that woman believed so strongly that God was gonna send a miracle. And God was going to awake her child and cure her child. And she was going to celebrate that. And she was just waiting and waiting and waiting. And then her child died. And I remember the grief that filled that room. She had lost not just her child, but her role as a mother. She had also, though, lost her sense of faith and her sense of confidence in her religion. She had truly believed that if she did the things that, that her religion had told her to do, that there was gonna be a fairness and a, uh, an ability to influence the outcome. And her outcome was not met. And her grief still haunts me. We need to be able to assist people in dealing with these really difficult challenges. 
I had a patient once say that she finally realized that her cancer wasn't a punishment, but instead perhaps a preparation. And those words have also stayed with me. That idea that, that again, making somehow this makes sense in some way is an important piece of minimizing regret. And that, I think, is one of the key reasons that we in clinical practice are so important. We have a role not just to do anticipatory guidance and not just to do exquisite symptom management, but we all share the importance of minimizing regret helping people to take care of the business of end of life. That might mean doing a durable power of attorney for healthcare or estate planning or find, filling out a will. Certainly it means having backup plans for our responsibilities. Again, whether it's our possessions, our property, our pets, our parents, our children. And as we go through this, many people struggle, but there's ancient wisdom from almost every cultural tradition that says some variant of we can hope for the best, but to do a good job as adulting, we need to prepare for the worst. So being able to have backup plans to our backup plans is another key aspect of good end of life care. I've heard it says that perhaps true wisdom is knowing what animates our existence and then living accordingly. Being able to truly know what matters most and ensuring that our energy, especially when it becomes limited, as it will with end-of-life care, that we're able to make sure that we prioritize the things that matter most. No doubt all of you have sat at the bedside of someone who no longer had the energy to mow the lawn or do the dishes or do the household things that needed to be done and still then have time to hold their precious grandchildren or no longer had the energy to hold their children if they were not able to get um, assistance with the, the mechanical details of life. So being able to help people to prioritize, how do I use my energy when my energy is failing? How do I delegate? How do I turn this into the best possible opportunity to have each day matter the most? Now, perhaps again, this is where faith, and again, uh, air quotes around that word, um, comes in. What's our perspective? Do we believe that there is an opportunity for good to come, even out of really difficult circumstances? Can we have a strong enough system that's, that supports us when we're really being challenged? That, that perspective of is the world half full or half empty? No doubt you've been in the, the hospital room or the home uh, care setting or the nursing home bed where a person is going through the most horrible of, of physical circumstances and still filled with joy. And you leave that room and you go to the next one or the next home and there is a person who maybe is doing physiologically so much better and yet that person is angry and filled with fear and dread and, and is so challenged to um, get through the day. A lot of the difference is perspective. Are we able to see the world from that perspective that there are still good things and that we still can find meaning and purpose? Ira Bayak has written much in regard to this. When we're not sure what to do, these might be some defaults. Is there someone that we need to forgive? Someone we need to ask forgiveness from or offer forgiveness to? Is there someone that we need to thank? Someone that we need to say how we feel about them, to let them really know? Is there someone that we need to be able to say goodbye to? Those are some things that can be our defaults when someone's struggling and we're not sure where to go or what to do, how to support them. When families are struggling, we want to make sure that people have the opportunity because they're going to have all of these, these new roles as a caregiver. Um, we want to make sure that we support people as they're caring for their loved ones, um, supporting them by providing them good information so they too can have the anticipatory guidance that allows them to have the skills that they need ready so that they can minimize regret. 
We want to be sure that we support the discussions that can be so challenging around uh, do not resuscitate orders or pain management questions in today's world, questions about opioid use and abuse, um, questions about do I tube feed, do I do IV fluids, do we put the person on a ventilator, how do we deal with loss of cognitive capacity and issues of competence, um, what about decisions about going into hospice when people feel like that's giving up. We want to be able to support people so, again, they have the information that they need to make good decisions at end of life. I love this, um, this diagram. It's from one of my uh, colleagues, a wonderful social worker, and her team that, that looks at family conflict. And, of course, my, my, I'm mindful that all families deal with conflict. There is no, um, no family that's unscathed by differences of opinion. And, again, so being able to think about how, do we, how can we use their their history of, of what they've done to manage conflict in the past um, so that they can get through this new experience in the very best way possible. But there are some tips and strategies for us. When a person is actively facing end of life, we want to make sure that people understand the grief process and offer anticipatory guidance again through the actual process of dying. We want to help people with decision-making goals and helping them understand that, that decisions that were made under a different set of circumstances now might need to be re, uh, reconsidered as their goals of care begin to change. We want to definitely talk to people about advanced directives and assist people in shared goals of care. We want to make sure that through all of a person's experience at end of life that we're providing really exquisite symptom management and that we're addressing the needs of their loved ones, referring them out for additional support as needed. We want to make sure that we as professional caregivers are taking care of our own team and supporting everyone through, again, anticipatory grief and advocating for their patients' wishes regarding their own end of life care. We want to make sure that we can offer people assistance in what I'm going to call conscious legacy building. The idea that we are all building a legacy, we're not all though conscious of it. So being able to be thoughtful about what's the impact of this patient's death on the loved ones. What are the uh, logistics or barriers and opportunities that need to be done um, to make sure that the people's needs are met as as creatively as we possibly can. Um, again, many of you have probably worked with folks who were able to um, know the importance of celebrating a certain major milestone and made it happen um, even when that was extraordinarily difficult to do. I think of people who have gotten married in hospice or people who've uh, celebrated uh, Christmas in just in uh, July, people who said, you know, our 50th anniversary is coming up in November and it's May and they look like they're not going to be able to live that long. And people have said, we can make this happen. We can have that celebration. People who always wanted to go to Italy but can't, can we do something to create the experience of what that might have been like for that person? Can we, you know, break the, the bounds um, that, that sometimes stifle us and be able to do again the things that need to be done so that people's experience can be the very best it possibly can be? Be mindful about how we handle adversity. We are mentors to the patients and the families that we see. So again, we want to be able to offer good guidance and support and um, help the families to create the memories that they're going to treasure for the rest of their lives. We want to offer, also offer, though, reminders for the caregivers not to overextend and to still be able to refill their own buckets. They need to nurture themselves as they care for their patient um, that's going through this experience. Balancing sociability with solitude is going to be an important um, uh, piece of advice. Families often struggle with really concrete decisions. When to say when. When is enough enough? Being able to find the good in goodbye. From the dying person's perspective, 
they're losing everything. It's as if the entire world were ending. And so there's so much loss. Being able to help people to deal again with really good symptom control because otherwise they're overwhelmed with the fatigue or the pain or the fear or the dyspnea or the anorexia or the constipation or the diarrhea or the fevers or the chills. How can we support people to go through this experience and be able to prioritize the things that matter most if we're not able to address those concrete physical needs? We want to make sure, again, that we are able to create a, quote, sacred space for the dying to occur. And that's whether or not it is in um, a home care setting or a skilled nursing facility or a hospital, wherever that person is, how do we create the, the environment and the ambiance that is needed for it to be as peaceful as possible for that person? How do we normalize the experience? People have been dying forever. How can we help these people to feel confident that they're doing it in the very best possible way for themselves? Can we offer empathy and reassurance? We need to offer culturally relevant rituals. We need to be able to educate and support the bereaved. And we need to be a companioning presence able to bear witness. It's one of the most important pieces of what we can offer. As we anticipate the, the end of life experience, we want to be able to support the, the people who are um, becoming bereaved. What's their loss history? How many? How recent? How significant? How did they cope and manage? How do they describe it? We want to be able to understand what their experience has been so that we can support it. Knowing the manner of their death, um, the timing in their life cycle, how the family functioned both before and after, how they manage communication and problem solving, what kinds of support they've had, what their culturally significant mourning rituals are, what the historical and political and cultural context is of their experience. The more we can identify those, the more we can support that person. We know that people are at risk for complicated bereavement if they've not had a good chance to deal with some of these issues, or if they've had ambivalence regarding the relationship, or if they've been dependent upon the deceased. We need to make sure that we can assist people who might um, need to regain functioning. Maybe the person who's dying has been the person who was the sole driver or cook or the manager of their finances. How do we support people with the challenges of their role as it changes? And we know that people struggle with feeling guilt or self-reproach. Many people feel blame. If I'd only noticed that cough sooner, if I'd have made sure he came to see the doctor earlier, if we wouldn't have lost our job and lost our insurance. We need to hear those words and make sure that we address those concerns. People with a history of, of isolation or um, who are withdrawn or who uh, have a history of substance use and abuse. We want to be especially conscious for the people who are emotionally fragile, people, again, who others might describe as distraught or ready to explode. Um, we want to be sure that we offer the support that's needed, that we anticipate where those people are going to have needs. We want to understand what other things are going on. Are there concurrent life crises? Is this loss going to trigger an existential crisis? Is there suicidal or homicidal ideation? Do they have the history or means? We want to be thoughtful again of their level of hopelessness regarding their future. Is there a financial difficulty that we can anticipate? Are there going to be different other losses that follow from this? Will there be a need for relocation? Um, is this loss going to be perceived as punishment or failure on their part? What are the implications for other relationships? And we want to be mindful of the impact on children. Sometimes when an older person dies, we forget that this person was a beloved aunt or uncle or grandmother or grandfather. Can we support all of the people who are struggling with this person's demise? Because ultimately, there's the possibility for post-traumatic growth. 
And we need to be able to understand. Um, there have been now much more research in the area of positive psychology and, and this concept of post-traumatic growth. And we can understand better how we can assist people in integrating understanding of these events um, and help them to be able to make meaning and be able to um, uh, repurpose their lives following this loss so that they can have the best possible outcome. And we want never to minimize the importance of the family caregivers in companioning and us as professional caregivers in companioning a person who's going through the depths of the struggle associated with end of life care. Being able to bear witness to that to be able to tolerate the unanswerable questions, the why me, why now, why my family, being able to tolerate not having answers is a really important piece. Having courage to sit with someone and share the journey, being able to adapt our situation as needed, being able to give voice to the suffering. We need to be able to provide a companioning presence, giving permission for the feelings, Offering active listening, being able to be silent, offering reassurance when appropriate, supporting people in, in identifying their support systems, using the specialists that surround us, whether it's spiritual um, professionals or, or perhaps bereavement um, specialists, being able to normalize and individualize the grief process, actualizing the loss and facilitating living without the deceased. Those are important things for us to know. And as we go through this experience, we need to be mindful that this takes a, a potential impact on us as well. The cumulative loss that we experience can lead to burnout or compassionate fatigue or a lovely phrase called vicarious traumatization. These are not new concepts and they're often um, things that, that we forget to attend to in our busy, fast-paced care of the ill. We need to make sure that we spend some time thinking about how we make sense of our own mortality. We can't do this work authentically if we're not mindful of that. We know that we are going to identify with some patients more than others. And we know that each loss is going to be an invitation to grieve our own past losses. We need to make sense out of our own sense of meaning. We need to answer questions about what we believe regarding life and end of life and what happens after death. We need to make peace with the unanswered questions. And we certainly need to sit, uh, take care of ourselves. Here's just a, a brief listing um, of some self-care strategies. It's important for us, again, to make sure we have a self-care plan and that we think about how we as a team at work can take care of one another. Uh, many of us have uh, noted the benefits of starting team meetings with perhaps a, a poem or a prayer or a song lyric that can um, help us to be mindful of the importance of the work we do. Having a chance to have um, uh, moments set aside where we say the names and honor the memory of the people that we've cared about who have passed. Being able to, to memorialize our own losses is an important part of self-care. It's also though important for us to be mindful that it's not our experience, it's someone else's end of life and we need to be able to let go. We need to have boundaries and balance and we need to be able to center ourselves and reframe the experience. We certainly can benefit from vicarious learning. And we know that we can learn to be more authentic from watching the people who are struggling with inauthenticity in their lives. And it's a reminder that relationships matter, whether our relationship again to some higher power, a relationship with our pets, our families, whatever that might be, our own sense of meaning and purpose needs to be thought of. Death can remind us to pay attention to the bigger picture and to uh, the importance of being able to share in others' sacred moments, to live our own life as if it matters. It has transformative potential. And I invite you to think about what you might do if you only had a limited time to live. What would you do if this were your last life, last year of life? 
And it's important for us to be mindful that care does not end with the death of a patient. We need to be, again, caring for those who've been caregivers, whether the personal or professional people in our life we can care um, for others. And for us to be mindful that dying well is really about living well, being able to uh, be mindful that the care we take of others is going to have a legacy that will last far beyond that person's lifetime. This is from the Golter Gate at the City of Hope where I used to work and I just love it because it says there is no profit in curing the body if in the process we destroy the soul. The work of end of life care is soul work and I thank all of you who've stayed on with us um, to, to go through this seminar um, for you, the good work that you're doing. And I believe that leads us to questions. And Sarah, I can't hear you if there are any questions. Shirley? Yes. Are you having technical problems? Um, I'm not. Yes, I am. I'm not able to move slides anymore. And I don't see or hear. There we go. Thank you for helping. Um, You're welcome. And this, I'm sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> thank you. I'm not sure if I lost audio, but if there are some questions. Let's see what we have here. Well, we had some technical problems. And again, I do apologize for that. The system seemed to have crashed for a moment, but it got back online just for the very end. So I'm very sorry about that. Um, we also have a question about when, um, Shirley, do you recommend talking about end of life care um, in, in terms of a cancer diagnosis? Like how, when is too early, I guess, is the question. Right. Thank you. Um, you know, many people struggle with that when a person's newly diagnosed and, and it, it, so many of us in, in uh, oncology care are really focused on trying to be hopeful and, and of course, helpful um, to the person who's really struggling with that. And it can seem um, a poor time to talk about end of life care when the person is working so very hard to try and uh, seek a cure or um, prolong their life as long as possible. And so our default in healthcare, I'm afraid, is too often we wait. Uh, we don't address palliative care or refer people to hospice until the person is really quite um, seriously ill and, and often has very advanced uh, illness and is really uh, imminently dying. And so they're not able to get the full benefit of both hospice or palliative care if that's our, our default response. So there's been a lot of folks who've encouraged us to have simultaneous um, uh, referrals to palliative care um, so that we can have a more integrated approach. And, and we know that if the two options feel like too early or too late, uh, we certainly have lots of data that remind us of the challenges of having too late conversations and too late referrals. Um, so there's a lot to be said for being able to integrate our um, conversations with people about advanced care planning and normalize that for folks um, from the very earliest moments of diagnosis. Being able to normalize that goes a long way. Then it's not because I see that something's particularly wrong with you. It's because everyone who's going through a cancer experience has concerns and questions about this. And we'd like to be sure to offer you the best support possible. And we have a team that can help uh, to do that. So an early integration of those is associated um, in the research with uh, much better outcomes for the patients and families and also for the providers feeling better about the care that they can offer to people as well. Thank you. Thank Are you for handling that. While we wait and see if more questions come through, of um, the continuing education 
requirements. Now we've gone black, but I think you can still hear me. Um, oh, we went forward here. Let's try this again. I'm so sorry, people. Uh, here we go. Continuing education unit. Um, if you, um, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I just want to remind you that if you are looking for CEUs, you'll need to complete the evaluation within one week. And I will send you an email with the evaluation link by Friday. I'm really skeptical that I'm going to be able to send the evaluation link after this webinar because we're having so many technical problems. But hopefully I will do that as well. But if not, just look at your email because it will be coming through on your email. And even if you're not looking for continuing education units, please fill out the evaluation. Um, we truly appreciate your feedback and, and are always looking to improve. So thank you. And one more check to see if we have any more questions. And it looks like we don't. Uh, there is a thank you, Shirley. Always wonderful. Always wonderful. So that's very nice to hear. Um, and so that brings us. Thank you so much um, for staying with us. And um, look out for that survey link. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Goodbye. <laughs>